um, some of the questions that we had the other day. Um, uh, it seems that children are able to learn uh, many interesting things off of uh, self-study and group study on the internet, but can, can kids teach themselves uh, creative arts? Well, it depends on uh, what kind of creative arts uh, you're talking about. Um, in my experience, uh, they make they seem to be able to make some progress with, for example, drawing, um, drama. Um, these are the two instances that I know. Um, uh, and if you were to include, for example, uh, cooking into creative arts, then uh, uh, then also it works. Basically. Um, they use a mixture of uh, searches and particularly of videos from YouTube and so on. And uh, then they simply, you know, attempt to do the same things. So the answer I think is yes, although I would say that uh, teachers need to experiment with this a little bit more. Um, uh, my experience in this area is uh, limited. Yeah. Actually, when I first uh, became interested in your work, I talked to my cousin about you. He's a professional chef. And I asked him, do you think, uh, given, um, given the right circumstances, the right materials, and the internet, do you think you could have taught yourself cooking? He had gone to uh, cooking school and, mm -hmm. and uh, spent some time in cooking college. And he, he thought, probably not. You have to have some kind of uh, mentoring, someone to mm. show you how to chop your onions and the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it, to watch what you're doing and to have that immediate feedback. That's what he thought. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I mean, I think there are pros and cons. Uh, obviously, if you have a mentor, uh, the process of your uh, learning something becomes quicker, uh, assuming that you uh, are paying full attention and, and so on. Um, where uh, the mentoring method tends to fail or to do badly is if the students are not uh, particularly interested in uh, what they're watching. Uh, on the other hand, in uh, self-organized learning, there is a built-in assumption that they're watching all this stuff because they really want to watch it. Nobody is, uh, nobody is telling them that you have to do this. In fact, in a self-organized learning environment, if you tell children that they have to do something, then it doesn't work. Okay, I've had numerous examples of where teachers would say, oh, it didn't work. And I would say, well, what did you do? So I asked them to look at these websites and they were doing everything else. So, you know, it doesn't work that way. But if a child is interested and does therefore look uh, carefully at whatever he or she is finding, and if they're in groups, then uh, while the process may be slower, but I think they will get to the same or similar uh, kinds of results. There is also a slight advantage um, in the self-organized environment, which is, that when you learn how to chop onions from a chef, you only learn the chef's way of chopping onions. You do not uh, even consider inventing your own way to chop an onion. Whereas uh, self-taught cooks, and I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'm one of them, <laughs> self-taught cooks uh, tend to experiment a lot and if you're in a hurry, you might say, well, what happens if I, if I don't even chop it at all, if I just cut it into four little pieces and chuck them in? And then you find, oh, but that worked. So you've just got a little new method. So, um, so there are pros and cons. If you're in a hurry, um, go ahead, get someone to teach you, tell you exactly what to do, and hope for the best. If you're not, and you want to develop yourself, then use the slower method. Good point. Okay. The next question um, uh, is regarding um, children and their, uh, oh, sorry, it's regarding the freedom that children have in running souls. Um, 
uh, I, in, the, in the movie, uh, The School in England, uh, part of the kid's school day was devoted to doing a soul. And uh, the question came up, um, if they were doing a soul and their education during that portion was freestyle, then to an extent they were deviating from uh, the country's plan for their education. Now, um, uh, I think most teachers don't really want to have countries and governments dictate uh, what education kids get. But uh, the question came, shouldn't a country have some kind of policy about what to teach children rather than letting the kids roam freely on the internet? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the biggest misunderstandings about my work is that people sort of interpret it as you leave the children to learn whatever they want. It sounds fine. Except that, how would you know what you want? So uh, if, you, if you see what I mean, that um, if, if, I, if I'm trying to, to, to learn, uh, I don't know, if, if, if I'm trying to learn how to knit, uh, then I could perhaps do it on my own. I could look up the internet, I could do all sorts of things, I could practice. But what if the thought of learning how to knit never entered my head? Uh, would it then be justifiable to say that it's all right if I spend my whole life not even knowing what knitting was? So that's where I think policy comes into the picture. Except that policy, uh, is a delicate and somewhat dangerous ground. Policy can get affected by ideology, by politics, by all sorts of things. Um, if we can avoid all of that, and if we can make the policy generic enough, um, you know, without going too much into detail, if we were to say, it's important for children to learn history, as opposed to saying, it is important for children to learn the history of, and then give a whole long list, which most countries do. Hmm. Uh, and in that list, they sometimes leave out stuff which they don't want the children to learn. Uh, that doesn't work. So I'm still looking for a country that has a generic enough curriculum so that we don't leave things out just from oversight. But at the same time, we don't go into the kind of detail that might lead us into ideology of some sort. Um, there's more, more work needed on that. And I guess it's, it's us academics who should be doing that work, uh, I think, a little more seriously than we have. Yeah, yeah. very good point. Um, uh... Uh, continuing the same theme, um, when, when kids spend more and more of their time as they are doing on the internet, and the internet is guiding what we know, and what, to a degree, what we think, um, will that affect students' relationships, young people's relationships with their parents and their, you know, their grandparents' cultures? And... Uh, yeah, basically, will it, will it affect culture? Well, we, we are on delicate ground again. It's a question of uh, whose culture, what culture, uh, for what purpose. Uh, is it because of history? Is it because of self-identity? Uh, or is it because of something else? Is it because of religion? I don't know. So uh, I would say, can there be a collective view of culture? Can there be, for example, a collective view of what a value system should be? And indeed, we do have some. We do have some. I mean, in almost every culture, 
we know uh, people would say uh, you should not kill another person it's kind of taken for granted that that is a collective value system that all of us have and it probably has an evolutionary reason because it's not good for the species if you don't have a rule like that but on the other hand there are also uh, little rules which go under the name of culture but are actually derived from either history or from bigotry once again, we need to be courageous enough to confront those and rule them out as perhaps not scientific, perhaps not logical, perhaps uh, not even moral. Uh, but as we all know, it's very touchy ground. It ends up with wars <laughs> sometimes. So, uh, so the answer to your question, your grandparents' culture, well, when I think back to my own uh, society, there are many things from my grandparents' culture that I retain, and there are many that I don't. And of the ones that I don't, um, there are often enough some very tangible reasons for why I don't. You know, to give you a, a, a really silly example, in the tropics, it, is a, it used to be a bit of a cultural thing to, to have salt heaped on your plate, heaped in a heap. These were climates, such as the one I grew up in, with a humidity of 100%. If you didn't have that salt, you could die. Mm -hmm. Jump forward to the temperate climate of the West. If you eat salt, your blood pressure goes up. So uh, what should a child do? Or what should anyone do? Well, examine the cultural value in the view of the environment and in the view of what we know now that we didn't know earlier and then say yes if you are in the tropics it's a good idea to have a lot of salt if you're not it's a bad idea drop it so uh, <laughs> there's not much of an example of this but i think it illustrates what i'm trying to say and you could actually apply it to all kinds of things including our habits of dressing for example, what is culturally acceptable, what is not, what should be covered and what should be not. We often don't go back enough to figure out what were the geographic and climactic reasons why these so-called cultural norms evolved. Um, I think we need to know that, or at best, or at worst, <laughs> We need to sensitize our children to the fact that culture itself evolves and has a reason. Yes, yes. very good point again. Uh, next question about big questions. Uh, is it better for big questions to be written, designed by the children? Or is it better for them to come from adults? Or do they, uh, is this a different category of big question? Well, I would say uh, a bit of mo bit of both, but uh, to be honest, my experience with questions designed by children uh, are often uh, fall into two categories. One is they can be very simplistic. Okay, just a thought, you know. I mean, uh, whatever, or they can be absolutely humongously difficult. For instance, I'll give you examples of both. 12-year-olds um, generating a question, um, uh, is it going to get hot because of climate change? Okay, 
Fair enough, not a bad question. Results in a reasonably good soul. But to me, I would have phrased that question differently. I did, in fact. I started a soul by saying, by posing the question, what's the difference between climate and weather? And then take it from there. Now, I don't think the children would have thought of this question. So I think we, in a soul, we run the danger of downgrading the adults too much. Say, you know, they're not required. They should be there too. <laughs> we don't need a teacher. That's not true. We need the adults, but we need them to do different things. On the other hand, is the other extreme. The question posed once to me by a five-year-old, are we real? Now, I, you know, I'm a physicist by training. I wouldn't dare take that question on. <laughs> So, so, uh, so I had to, I had to sort of weave my way around that question to something else. But uh, they do make questions like that. Um, another question that uh, nine-year-olds made in England: Who made space? I said, huh? and they said, you know, space. Well, everything's made by some force, by something. So who made space? And I said, I don't know. I actually let them tackle that question. It was a Church of England school. They ended up with the conclusion, we don't know who made space, but it could not have been God because God would need space in order to exist. Hmm. <laughs> I at that point had to say, I mean, let's just not get into that, okay? <laughs> <Let's>, <laughs> so so this, is the, this is the danger because children can take you to the edges of our deepest misunderstandings. Uh, it also shows that these misunderstandings are not invisible to them. They can sense our nervousness. Mm. Um, it's up to the teacher again, or to the school, or to the state. Should we let them, or should we not? Okay, a couple more questions and then I'll let you go. Um, uh, this comes from um, one of my uh, colleagues here in Japan. Uh, it seems that the current education s school systems around the world are creations of uh, previous empires to control people and to control information. Um, how, how is this going to change? How can uh, our generation or the next generation turn that around? Well, let me, let me play devil's advocate. I don't think it was as much about control as about keeping the social machinery in running order in a society that had no automation. It was necessary, therefore, to have people who would, for example, uh, lift things and take them from one place to another, something that machines do all the time now. Mm -hmm. There was a time when we needed people to do that. Any normal person would say, well, couldn't I do something else? Couldn't I do something more interesting? It was necessary to have an education system that said, we need some people who will lift things and take them from one place to the other. We can't survive without them. They are important. You need to be one of them because we can't run the show without you. Okay, it can result in your talking about unfairness, about, uh, you know, all, all sorts of things like that, including, uh, in its extreme, the caste system. We need people to clean the gutters. Uh, we can't help it. We just need them. They've got to come from somewhere. Jump forward to the 21st century. Well, luckily, we've got automation does all most of the dirty work for us. 
So what can we now say to people? We can say, you, you choose. We couldn't have said that earlier. I, I must emphasize that there was a time when you couldn't have given that choice if you were the head of the government because you would not get a sustainable society. Since we have the choice now, we need to look at, so how many kinds of people do we need today? What if everybody said, I want to become a poet? Well, we can't run, the, we can't run our society again with, with you know, a billion poets. We would then have to say, but we need some engineers need some mathematicians. You can see signs of that in countries where they say not enough children are going into STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Hmm. Why? Because we've given them the choice and they've chosen not to. I've asked many such children, why don't you do mathematics? It's hard. One child in England asked me many years ago, I asked him, why don't you want to become, uh, I asked him, don't you want to become a professor like me? And he said, why would I work for years and years and years to become a professor like you when I can earn just about that much by being a bus driver? <laughs> so, it doesn't say much about professor salaries. In right. The <laughs> but, but anyway, but I was taken aback and I said, uh, well, um, so would you be happy just being a bus driver all your life? He said, who's talking about all my life? I'll be a bus driver for three months. So, and what would you do? i save up enough money to take my girlfriend out for a holiday to Spain. And then, oh, I'll come back. And I said, what if, what if they don't have the bus driver's job left anymore? It doesn't matter, I'll be a supermarket clerk. And then I'll work for six months and I'll save up again some money and I'll go for a holiday. I never thought like that when I was young. I certainly didn't think like this when I became a professor. I probably wouldn't have become one if I did. <laughs> so, so what should we do in a society where children can be given the choice? Well, I would suggest that they should investigate what composition of society is needed today to maintain a stable culture and civilization. Let them figure it out. Let them come back to us and say, we need programmers. We need people to build bridges and we need people to mow the lawn. If we can do that, We've solved the problem. All right. Last question then, because actually Zoom is going to kick us, kick us out soon. So last question. Um, uh, like in the, in the movie in um, England, you had souls within a standard state school, right? That was a state school? Yeah. Can, can souls mesh with... Um, with uh, you know standardized educational systems. Well, I face that question increasingly. Uh, the answer is yes, and that answer comes from England. Uh, in the schools where I had set up these schools in the cloud facilities, the first uh, objections were: it's wonderful, but it's not going to help the children during the exams. Which is true; it doesn't. Souls do not help at all for conventional exams. But they didn't shut it down. What the teachers did was they meshed the school in the cloud with the existing system. How do they do that? Well, one of the ways is to give an exam question as a sole question and let the group solve it together. We don't know as yet, and I would like to know, if doing this repeatedly will actually improve the individual competencies of being able to answer examination questions. It's possible that it may. The other way they mesh the two methods in is to start a topic with a question. So if the curriculum said, teach them geometry, they would start a question. For example, they would say, 
Um, why are triangles important? Are they important? Are they more important than a square? And you know the soul, it would go all over the place and so on and so forth, probably land itself into trigonometry. And then you say, well, let me tell you the history of trigonometry. But the man who solved the right angle triangle, they killed him. His name was Pythagoras, etc. And suddenly, the whole nature of geometry changes. I admire the teachers who were able to do this meshing. And I would encourage every teacher to try to do it. It's not easy, but it can be done. Mm. Okay. Um, have you heard the, anything uh, from the schools in England about whether their, their average exam results are better than they were before the souls were implemented or whether they're better compared to other schools? Uh, there are, uh, you know, there's a, there's a body called Ofsted in yeah. England, which is the state government body which reports to the parliament about uh, the quality of schools. I've had two official mentions in Ofsted, and they're both very interesting. They're both available actually publicly. They mention the fact that the children appear to be more relaxed, more communicative, and less worried about answering questions or taking on a problem. And they, not I, directly attributed it to souls. Would that, would that be a good answer to your question? Probably not. Will they do better at the exam? We have, I have no evidence that it does. But I will end with what a school principal once told me when I asked him, why do you do souls when they're not going to help in exams? And he showed me the football field and he said, you know, we let the children play football. It does nothing for their exams. But we don't remove the football field because in the end, where our society goes, what inventions we make, what wars we win, depends more on those football fields than on the exams. And I thought that was a brilliant answer. The soul, the school in the cloud, is a playground for the mind. I see. Uh, Professor Mitra, thank you very much for the interview. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you again. Have a nice day there. Bye. Bye now. Bye.